I want to begin today by taking a walk down memory lane. I want you all to think back to your years in school. Think those mornings walking down the hall to your classroom, the announcements blaring off of the intercom, the smell of your science textbook at nine in the morning. Now, think about what kind of student you were. Perhaps you were that straight A student. You aced all your tests, did all your homework, or maybe you weren't so great of a student. Maybe you struggled in class, or you didn't care, or you had other priorities. I was somewhere in the middle. My grades were decent enough in school, enough to make my parents happy and my teachers content. I did okay in most of my subjects, but I was very average as far as a student goes. In fact, I was so unremarkable. I remember one time in the fourth grade when our teacher was handing out holiday cards to all the students in the class before the holiday break. Realizing she hadn't given me mine, I walked up to her desk and asked her, where's my card? I then saw the look of shock on her face when she realized she didn't write me one. As if that wasn't bad enough, she then opens her drawer, pulls out a blank card, and writes one there in front of me. Really? That's just an example, but I was a very, very average student. However, one fateful day, everything changed. There was an event that completely changed my life, altered my career, and transformed my way of thinking. And that day was Hat Day. Hat Day was an annual tradition at our school. One day a year, all the students would wear some silly hat, and whoever wore the silliest hat won a prize. Now, I never participated in it. In fact, it wasn't even a big deal at all. But this year was different. A group of my friends were talking in the cafeteria about which hat they were going to wear the next day. They asked me, what hat are you wearing? I didn't know. I hadn't thought about it. I wasn't planning on participating. But the question did stay on my mind the rest of the day. I went home, and I ate dinner, and I started working on my homework assignment due the next day. The homework assignment was a science project. We were to create a display on dinosaurs and what we knew about them. And then I had an idea. And I thought to myself, what if I made my science project my hat? So I went to my mom and I told her my idea. And my mom, the most supportive person in the world, was ecstatic. She told me, yes, let's do this. Let's figure this out. So we worked all evening, stayed up till 2 or 3 in the morning, brainstorming and finding crafting materials around the house, uh, Play-Doh, toys, aluminum foil, blocks, whatever we could find. And we created a dinosaur paradise in a hat. We took an aluminum tray, turned it upside down, and put a bowl under it that would fit on my head. Then on top of this tray, we created this dinosaur field. We put some boulders and some trees and some bushes, and we created some leaf-eating dinosaurs eating the trees, and meat-eating dinosaurs eating the leaf-eating dinosaurs. Over on this corner of the tray, we had two dinosaurs fighting. Over on this corner of the tray, we had a dinosaur falling off of the hat, hanging by a string. So when I put on the hat and walked, it would sway back and forth. I was so excited. The next day at school, I can tell you, I was no longer unremarkable. Everyone was so excited about looking at my hat and asking me questions. Students and teachers alike were so, so excited to see the dinosaurs living the dinosaur life on top of my head. At the end of that very awesome day, I heard on the announcement that I had won hat day. And better yet, I got an A on my assignment. That was such a memorable experience to me, and particularly because it got me excited. It got me excited about school, about doing something that I previously wasn't very excited about. Now, I didn't know it then, but I was applying early foundational concepts of edutainment. Today, I want to talk to you all about edutainment. What is it? Well, grammatically, it's just the blending of two words, entertainment and education. You may have heard it in various other formats. You may have heard infotainment. You may have heard gamification. That's the new buzzword nowadays, where you take gaming elements and applying them to non-gaming curriculum to make things more exciting. They all mean the same thing. In fact, gamification is just a specific form of the wider umbrella of edutainment. And it's where you create some kind of educational or entertaining program or activity or some object 
that has an educational purpose. Compare that with a lecture. The lecture is the oldest form of teaching, spanning thousands of years. And the concept is simple. One person talks, one person listens, and thus learning happens. Now, edutainment takes that concept a step further. Instead of focusing on just the content of what is being learned, it focuses on the method of delivery. How we're delivering that content is just as important in order for learning to take place. We have evidence of edutainment as early as the 1900s, when classrooms had paper-based games to get kids educated and engage in that education. But as technology has continued to evolve, so has the opportunities for edutainment programs. In 1969, Sesame Street came to television screens all across the country, and it revolutionized education. It taught phonics and numbers and letters to children at home, something they traditionally only did at school, and they loved it. That inspired so many more programming after that. In 1971, the electric company also was introduced, following the success of Sesame Street, now teaching STEM subjects to children at home, and also with a really awesome theme song, for those of you who remember. It was amazing, but 1971 was also an important year because that was the release of another edutainment favorite, Oregon Trail, a game that is nostalgic for many here. It is a game, a survival game, where students would learn about that period of time, but it was important simply because now there was two-way communication. Rather than just sitting there and listening and watching, they can provide input. Now the learning was even more engaging. This continued in 1983 with the release of the video game Math Blaster. This game allowed students to solve math problems to shoot enemy spaceships, now making math enjoyable and accessible to children. Now, it didn't stop there. Edutainment continued to evolve as technology allowed it to. Then came the simulators. Simulated video games for everything, teaching kids how to cook, how to build cities, how to build roller coasters, how to perform surgery. Most recently, last year, we had the release of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, which allows you to fly a realistic aircraft in a photorealistic depiction of real-world environments. Now, edutainment doesn't have to be high-tech. There's plenty of non-technology-related edutainment programs. One professor created a graphic novel to teach cell biology to his students. A card game was developed to teach nursing students about various health concepts. Various theater games and improv games have been developed to teach pre-service teachers how to work in a multicultural classroom. The possibilities are endless. So when I was a teenager, I was inspired. As I took from that example on Hat Day, I decided I want to do more with edutainment. So while other kids were outside playing, I was inside at home experimenting, tinkering. Now, I wasn't a computer whiz. I can't say I was very good at computer programming, but I did what I could with what I had. Using PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint, and nothing but hyperlinks and hundreds of slides, I created a choose-your-own-adventure point-and-click game called Virtual Life. In this game, the player took the form of an infant and would make small little decisions that would create branching paths. And based on those branching paths, they would grow up and live different lives. And depending on what decisions they made through every stage of their life, they have a bad ending, a good ending, or a great ending. And the goal of the game was to get the best ending possible. Now, this game wasn't in any way polished. It used stock sound effects and clip art images. But of the few people that played it, they loved it. They loved it so much, the concept about it, that I created an expansion pack using hundreds of more slides where now you can play virtual life and live the life of an animal. You can live the life of a turtle or a fish. And in addition to making survival decisions, you learn about their life cycles. I loved it. I was inspired. I decided to then, a few years later, take the concept even further. I volunteered at a summer program for first graders, and I took the idea of virtual life and instead created a different kind of game called a pirate adventure. 
the first graders would play the role of a cartoon pirate sailing the seven seas, and they would learn vocabulary words and concepts relating to boats and ships and geography and oceans. This time it was more polished. It was fully narrated. It was so much more complex with better animations, better sound, better visuals, and the kids loved it. They had such a great time. That inspired me further to go into education as a career. I went to college and then grad school to be our higher education administrator as I really wanted to work in a college environment. And one thing I learned while I was in school was that while edutainment was very, very popular among children, I didn't really see as much of it for adults. Why is that? When we grow up, should learning no longer be fun? Does it have to get serious? I didn't think so. So I decided that I needed to fix that problem and create edutainment programs for adults. The first thing I did in grad school was I took once again my virtual life concept, my PowerPoint template type of game, and I created a college management simulator. You would play the role of a college president and make day-to-day -day decisions that would help the college run smoothly. It was very well received by my peers and one instructor I showed it to. A little later, I was very involved in theater, and I, en I enjoyed acting in plays, so I decided to write a play. I wrote a play, a situational comedy, that took place inside a college, and it followed four young college students getting into a bunch of hijinks, but also teaching you about the day-to-day -day lives of college life. The show was produced three times in three different locations, viewed by both college-goers and non-college-goers alike. They loved it. There were glowing reviews, and they had a great time. But I had a problem. While I can see that people enjoyed all these works, I had no idea if they were learning. And learning is a crucial part of edutainment. So I decided that my next program had to have some kind of measure of learning. For the longest time, I wanted to write a book. It's one of those things where you procrastinate for years, but I decided this will be it. This will be the edutainment program that I do next. So I wrote a mystery novel. It had all of your traditional mystery novel tropes. It had murders and deception and a twist. But interspersed through all of that, it also had little images of college life. It followed various first-year college students as they got comfortable and they transitioned into the college atmosphere. So taking this novel that I wrote and published, I then grabbed a group of high school students, and I wanted to do a study. All of them were high school, so they hadn't gone to college yet. And over the span of two weeks, I had them read this book. I tested them on their college knowledge before reading the book and then after reading the book. And what I found was there was a lot of learning that happened in those two weeks. Just in those two weeks, these students learned more about making friends, about living in a dorm, talking to professors, paying for college, dealing with stress, all things from just two weeks. But that's not even the most interesting part. The most interesting part of the study was that the students that learned the most or had the most drastically changed views were the ones most invested in the story. One particular girl, a Hispanic girl, afterwards had told me that she related very strongly to a Hispanic girl in the novel named Gabriela. Now, Gabriela was a very quiet girl and for many parts of the book just struggled to make friends because of her quiet nature. So this student told me that she really related to Gabriela because she was just like her, and she was invested to see what happened to her throughout the rest of the story. Now, as someone who has taught workshops on how to break out of your shell and how to make friends, that is very hard to teach when they're not invested in learning. And she was invested. One of the hardest obstacles was passed. That is the power of edutainment. So why don't we see so much edutainment, particularly for adults? Two reasons, or two thoughts that I may have. One is money. I talk to many educators about edutainment, and they tell me, oh, I love the concept, but it's too expensive to buy those programs. Can't argue with that. Ready-made edutainment programs are expensive. But we're all creative, to some degree. We all have some kind of passion. Can't we just make our own programs? And then comes the second point, time. We're all busy. We all, we're doing so much with so little time. 
and it's easier to go with the status quo. We have ready-made programs, ready-made curricula. Why, why fix what isn't broken? But imagine if we were to just implement some edutainment programs here and there. And I'm not just talking teachers. I'm talking community leaders. I'm talking parents. It doesn't have to be in the classroom. There are so many opportunities for implementation, and as technology evolves, it allows us to create so many more programs. To conclude, edutainment is going nowhere. It's going to be here more and more and more, and as more phone apps are developed, and as more opportunities come about, we will be seeing it. So could you imagine if we supplemented traditional education? And I say supplemented, not replaced because traditional education is still important, it has its value, and it has its place. But if we supplement it with some edutainment programs, could you imagine what could happen? Maybe, just maybe, you could inspire someone to have a love of learning that wasn't there. Maybe you could be someone's next hat day. Thank you.